Hear now the readings first from the Old Testament book of Joshua. Hear this word. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors, the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who has brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land, Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And then turning over, hear this word, the lectionary reading for this Sunday from Mark's Gospel. From the first chapter. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. Repent, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther on, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as you just heard a moment ago, the lectionary gospel reading, the recommended reading for this Sunday, is from Mark. And in Mark's gospel, that particular story represents the very first action of Jesus' public ministry. I know uh, people who study literature for a living uh, will tell you that when you study a work of literature, it's always important to pay particular attention to what the author puts first in the story. You know, oftentimes it comes back in another form, uh, kind of foreshadows something. The opening lines of any particular work of literature, people who study things like that will tell you, something you should take note of. And uh, for Mark... It's the story of Jesus getting up from the waters of baptism and immediately, Mark uses that word a lot, immediately he went to the Sea of Galilee, the lakeshore, which is not a far walk from the Jordan River. And there he finds Peter and Andrew and James and John, sons of Zebedee, tending their nets on the beach, getting ready to make their way out onto the Sea of Galilee for another day of commercial fishing, which is how they sustain themselves. Follow me, that's what he said. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And in what has to qualify as one of the great miracles in all the Bible, all four of those guys did that. I mean, I think, you know... We think of miracles in the Bible, we tend to think of things like the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, or, or we tend to think about Jesus changing water into wine. Uh, but I have to say that, to me, 
A more amazing miracle than that is this story, that he could come up to these four ordinary guys, minding their own business, not looking for any new work, and say this simple word of invitation. And lo and behold, they all get up, and they leave their work, their safety. They left Father Zebedee standing in the boat, dumbstruck with his, you know, uh, it must have broken his heart, you suppose? I don't know. We don't know what happened to Zebedee, or the, uh, the father. But they leave their livelihood, their families. And just at that suggestion, Jesus says, I'll guide you. I'll guide you. And with me, you will be a part of something bigger than you ever imagined. You will be a part of, of building up something, a catch uh, that's more substantive and more amazing and more significant than anything you ever dreamed you'd play a part in. When I read this story, I am reminded of a wonderful quote from the late William Sloan Coffin. He was chaplain at Yale for a number of years. And when he got near the end of his life, he published a little book of reflections. Uh, one of them uh, strikes me as being completely uh, relevant to this story. He says, how I love the recklessness of faith. So often in the life of faith, he said, first you jump and then you grow wings. That's a good way to say it. I mean, that's kind of what Jesus asked them to do. Take, jump off the cliff with me, and I promise you'll grow wings before you've hit the ground. And lo and behold, they do it. And Mark says, that's the first thing you need to know about this man, Jesus. That's the first story I want to put in front of you when I write my gospel. Mark writes a gospel, you know, differently than any of the other ones. I kind of like Mark because he's a little quirky in the way that he tells the story. Uh, you know, both Matthew and Luke in particular, they have a lot of buildup to the Jesus adult life. I mean, they, they, we get all the Christmas stuff from Matthew and Luke. They go through all of the long lineage of Jesus, making sure that we know that he's from royal stock, he's of the house and lineage of David. We get all of that. We get all of the conversation about Mary and Joseph and this miraculous pregnancy of Mary through the Holy Spirit, and that too is submitted by both Matthew and Luke as, as the evidence of Jesus' messiahship, that he's special. This is somebody that's different than everybody else. He really is who he says. He is. All this, you know, lineage talk and all this specialness surrounding his birth. Mark he has no Christmas spirit at all. He, he omits it all. He doesn't care any. I don't care about the lineage. He, by omission, he basically says. I don't care about the specialness of the birth. For me, it's not the genealogy. It's not the pedigree. It's the actions of this man. That's what really, it's kind of like, for Mark, the proof of the Messiahship is in the pudding. You know, you see it in the transformed lives that start to follow immediately, Mark says, as he gets up from the water of baptism. And he's got this capacity as the Messiah to take ordinary people and call them to extraordinary living through his words and actions about what the kingdom of God is all about. Even if it cost him his life to do that, he makes that so compellingly and so transformatively. And that's why only 14 verses into the Gospel of Mark, we're already up to this point where Jesus is by the Sea of Galilee. And Mark tells it like this, getting down to business. Uh, he immediately got up from the waters of baptism. And now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And you may have a vague remembrance uh, that that's not the first time somebody has said that. Those who would have heard Jesus say that for the first time, it would have sounded familiar to them too because it was the same thing John the Baptist had been saying, exactly, word for word, as John had been making his way around. And interestingly enough, it's what would become the same message, the same words, almost word for word, that Jesus would offer us as a script, basically, for the 12, once he had recruited all the 12 disciples. You remember when he recruits them, at one point he sends them out in pairs for the first missionary journey. And, and you remember his advice, go into the towns and say to the people, repent, believe the good news, for the kingdom of God has come near. So it's an important message, but over 2,000 years of 
Christian history, our understanding of that message, I think, has become a little garbled, especially around the whole issue of repentance. I think we've gotten the idea of repentance kind of muddy now to the point where we assume this word has only a negative and a kind of moralistic meaning. I mean, for most people these days, when you ask them about repentance, what it means, they'll say, well, it means being sorry, it means somehow trying to pay up for, atone for mistakes, for sins I've made. It's trying to do something to make up for things that I regret in my life. Repentance, in other words, has come to be really more like penance in the, the, the old Catholic tradition, kind of paying off your debt, saying, and saying the right kind of prayers, the right kind of actions, doing something to make right what you have done wrong. And one byproduct of that understanding of repentance is that folks whose lives are not seriously off the track tend to feel like they don't really have any real use for repentance at all. They don't need to repent or they don't know what good repentance would bring in their life. I mean, I'm not all that bad. Nobody's perfect, right? And I'm sure I have my flaws, but they're not all that significant. People shy away from taking repentance seriously, I think because the church has misappropriated what John the Baptist and later Jesus had in mind when they called people to repent. Uh, for, for John, and then especially for Jesus coming after him, repentance meant two things. I mean, it did mean turning away from those things in your life that were dragging you down, or those lesser gods that you have put on the, at the altar of your life that aren't worthy of your loyalty. Uh, the, only the one God is worthy of your ultimate loyalty. So it's turning away from all those lesser gods, desire for status or esteem or all of those kind of things that can get you off the track. So yeah, there is this dimension of turning away, but it also meant turning towards something. It meant choosing the life God is offering you now in its place. It was this twofold move, movement, basically, the New Testament version of repentance. First, you do, you have to wake up to the spiritual dead end that you've gotten yourself into. And maybe you're aware of it or maybe not, but you're, you, you wake up to wh where your life is off the track and, and the thinking that, you know, uh, well, nobody's perfect. That's, uh, or that this is as good as I can hope to be, that's nonsense. Repentance says you gotta wake up from that posture and the dead end that keeps your life kind of steeped in spiritual low expectation. And then you gotta start looking around though. The other piece of repentance is what are you gonna turn toward? Where, where is the depth calling to my depth? We call that, you know, the kingdom of God. That's why the message is always twofold. Repent and know that the kingdom of God is near turn away from what's unhealthy, but you've got to have something to go to. And repentance in the New Testament has always had those two dimensions. Because really, at least as I read the Gospels, in the Gospels there are really two and only two kinds of time for a Christian person. There is the time of preparation, and then there is the time of decision. Those are the two kinds of time that the Bible points us to it. And in any healthy spiritual life, we kind of go back and forth through our years between the two, times of preparation and times of choosing. But as far as our salvation is concerned, those are the two times that matter. There is the time of repentance or preparation, introspection, and kind of waking ourselves up to see that life is more than living like, you know, rats in a, a, a rat race or cogs in a machine. I've got an old Dennis the Menace cartoon I clipped out years ago where Dennis the Menace's dad is getting ready to leave for work. He's just going out the door. He's got his, uh, his old fedora on, his briefcase, and, and Dennis said, good luck, dad. I hope your rat wins the race. You know, I, that, that's, uh, life, to, to, to the time of preparation is the time when you learn, when you wake yourself up to the fact that life has to be more than, than living as a cog in a machine, one day after another, those kinds of things. And, and then there is the time to choose, which almost always in the Bible comes in the form of a divine calling. God saying in some circumstance, look, once you stop looking inward, you've got to get focused and where you can give your life to something better. He, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever would lose his life, for my sake, will find it. That's what Jesus does in Mark's call. First he says, repent, believe the good news, and then come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And the thing that fascinates me about all this 
is how simple it is. The simplicity of this call is amazing to me. He goes to the, that lake shore and he finds those four men and you know, there's no uh, request that they submit an application for employment. You know, he doesn't check about their theology. He doesn't even ask, say, uh, will you confess me as your Lord and Savior? Down the road he'll ask that, but at this point all he says is, follow me. Will you make a choice? Will you trust me enough? Will you trust me enough to take the leap and see if I can help you grow wings? as you make your way down the path. For them, on that day, the time of preparation and waiting was over and the time for choosing had come. And the truth is that that time comes for all of us, doesn't it? The time to make the choice. Uh, there's a story I like very much. Uh, Tom Long, who teaches preaching down in Georgia at Emory University, likes to tell the story about a time when one of his seminary students was uh, uh, given a student assignment not far uh, north of Atlanta in uh, uh, a rural parish there uh, and he paid a call one time on a parishioner who lived in an old colonial house that had been in the same family for more than 200 years and on entering this house the student minister was invited to the living room where he noticed uh, an old flintlock rifle was uh, hanging over the fireplace uh, kind of a mantelpiece there in that colonial house. And the student, uh, fascinated by it, uh, reached to, to take it off of its little pegs where it was hanging. And the elderly woman who owned the house said, oh, be careful, don't touch that. It's loaded and it might go off. And, and she went on to explain, she said, you see, my great, great, great grandfather bought that gun new and he loaded it up and put it there on the mantel in preparation for the day when he might strike a blow for freedom uh, against the redcoats in their invasion of the colonies. And the student hearing that story said, wow, that's remarkable. It's amazing that this rifle could have come through a war and still looks in such marvelous condition. And she replied, oh, he loaded it up and put it there, but he never got around to taking it down and using it. It's just, I guess, a tribute to uh, the family uh, moment uh, that with good intentions to take action, it just never materialized. And reflecting on that story, Tom Long would say, I know a lot of Christians like that too, you know, people who spend a lifetime loading up with the ammunition of faith only to cock the gun and put it up on the mantle and never get around to firing a shot for making a difference in this life. For too many of us in the church, the moment to take action just never seems to materialize. I know it can happen. It can happen to me, it happens to you. I, it, it, it's easier to do nothing sometimes than to overcome the fear of what might go wrong if we do something. You know, there's, what, what's that, uh, uh, the deliberate strategy of, of, uh, of low expectations? You know, if, if, I, if I don't hope for too much, I won't be too disappointed. If I sleep on the floor, I never fall out of bed. Uh, those kind of things, where it's, it's easy for that to be the case as we live our lives. Uh, Alan Patton, the, the, uh, the late great novelist from South Africa, once wrote a short story about this very thing. And the short story was entitled, The Challenge of Fear. And in the short story, he talked about how our lives are determined not so much by the forces and the powers outside of us, but by the fears that are on the inside of us. And, and Patton, who spent his whole life living in segregated uh, South Africa, believed it was fear it, it, that, that was really at the heart of, of all the dysfunction of that society. If it was fear that nurtured the separation, the segregation, the ignorance, the pride uh, for that whole long tortured period and kept people in bondage. And his article concludes with a, a, a lovely personal word. I, I've saved it for a long time. What then, he writes, has life taught me? She has taught me not to expect success to be inevitable as a result of my endeavors. She has taught me to seek sustenance from the endeavor of living itself and to leave the rest to God. It's a lesson that I learned twice. I learned it in my youth reading Sir Galahad and the Holy Grail, and I learned it far more deeply in my old age as I took to heart the story of Christ and his road to a cross. Two calls, one to get ready, one to prepare, to grow deeper, to repent, but also to turn uh, and get good at following Jesus, and then 
the call to choose. As I was thinking about this passage, it occurred to me that we've seen a small version of that interplay between the time to prepare and the time to act and, and make a choice. It, it, it's played out in church here the past year with our hospitality emphasis. I, I was reminded of it because the last time we read this passage in church was about a year ago. You remember we had the nets draped down here, the casting our nets theme was here. If you were here a year ago, you might remember. And we, we invited uh, a, a church consultant, Debbie Nixon's her name, from our flagship church out in Kansas City. We had Debbie come and just talk to us about being a hospi hospitable, gracious congregation. Not that we aren't hospitable and gracious, but we thought that's an area we want to be excellent at. Not because it's some corporate you know, strategy for growth, but because it's something we believe the, the gospel calls us to be, that community of warmth and, and graciousness and where people can come in from whatever circumstance of life and find themselves embraced. So, so Debbie led us basically in the time of preparation, didn't she? She, she came to give this wonderful kind of day of saying, here's how we've learned through our own mistakes to be as empathetic as we can. We try to see everything through the light, eyes of somebody brand new who might come to us today, and we ask ourselves, do they, do they see where they can go? Do they have somebody to greet them warmly? You may have noticed that some of those preparations Debbie talked to us about are starting to materialize into actions now. The parking lot greeters are out there. We've got some more parking that's uh, close to the building that's soon to be on the horizon, which you'll hear more about. But that idea that uh, we have a time to get ready so that when the opportunity presents itself, we, we can act. And, and one of the simple things we've talked about is, you've maybe heard me say it before, uh, practicing what, what Debbie called the 5 rule, you know, when, when you come to church, spend five minutes before the service and five minutes after the service concludes, not just immediately going to your best friends to visit, but looking around to see if there's somebody that you might greet. That's the five part. And then the 10 part, is the the ten foot radius around you? She said, if every church member would see that w the moment you walk through our doors, you have a an invisible ten foot circle around you that you're responsible for. You're the you're the hospitality host for that ten feet that circles around you. And everywhere you go, you see somebody that's not being engaged, and they're in your ten feet. You're called to act. Uh, we saw this little interplay of the time to prepare and then the time to choose playing out. And lo and behold, it's interesting. Did you know that, uh, I don't think it's coincidental, we've had kind of an upsurge of members at a rate we've not had for many, many years in this church. Uh, about 60 folks in the last 10 months have, have joined. I don't think that's a coincidence, do you? I don't. Uh, the, the point is, for the Christian, there are always two calls before us. Get ready and act. And um, it, it comes simply. It, I used to think it, didn't, it couldn't be this simple, but, but according to Mark and according to Peter and Andrew, James and John, sometimes you just get up and go. The waiting is over. The kingdom of God is at hand. Believe it. The good news. It's come simply still. The only question is, will, will we follow?